The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome to Yaron Brook Show. I hope you're having a great week. You're treating life well. Life doesn't treat you. But you treat life. Life treating you is way too passive. It assumes somebody else is in control. You are. Remember, you're on the rules, something like that. All right, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to talk politics today. have to do a politics show once in a while. I've been avoiding it, but uh, we're going to do a politics show today. I did do a debate earlier today with Zuby. I don't know how many of you know Zuby. Zuby is a rapper, podcaster, social commentator um, in the UK. Seems like a really nice guy. Obviously smart, intelligence, relig- intelligent, religious, um, but uh, I thought it was good. I thought it was good debate. It wasn't really a debate, discussion. Anyway, I'll post it up on my channel at some point, like when we're thin on content, like when I'm traveling. But uh, for now, it's available on a uh, Ironman Center UK. And I'm doing... One deb- a debate every Tuesday. Every Tuesday we do a debate. Last last week, last Tuesday I debated a Marxist. Next week I'm debating religion, I think. But the idea is to do every single week a debate, uh, at least through June. July I'll probably take off because I'm traveling all of July and, and the first half of August. And then actually I'm hoping to do some debates live. Drum roll, please. In London, so uh, I have already got tickets to fly to Israel for a week for for ten days, and then on to London from there. I am ecstatic about the possibility of leaving the United States for a little while. Um, we'll see if it happens. Of course, we'll see if the uh, if the COVID dictators, COVID do- uh, gods, allow uh, for the travel. But I'm really looking forward to uh, to it. Also uh, exciting when it comes to debate, I know many of you have asked for this. I've been hesitant, but the right circumstances has arisen, arisen, circumstances arise. Um, And I will be debating, it appears, still tentative, still tentative. I'll be debating uh, Richard Wolff, the socialist at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, sometime in September or October. So if you're in the Pennsylvania area, you can come by and see the debate again, assuming COVID gods allow universities to open and allow fl- allow everything to happen and people to congregate. Uh, we'll be doing that in, um, in uh, September or October. I was hoping to debate Stephanie Kelton and then we would have debated MMT but Stephanie's fee was much too high. You know, all the people really, really concerned about inequality, the people who really, really, really think inequality is a real problem, the people who think that printing money solves all the problems in the world, charge a hell of a lot of money to try to convince you that inequality is bad. I remember the famous story of Paul Krugman charging $250,000 for a talk on the evils of inequality. Yep, yep. This is, and, and it's not like, he, he, yeah, I'd prefer a debate with Kelton too. But she was too expensive for the student group. Richard Wolf is cheap, I guess. So, uh, so uh, we will, uh, I'll be debating Richard Wolf in, um, um, yeah, University of Pennsylvania. So that should be fun. What else is going on? Uh, Yeah, I'm hoping to be in London in um, the second week of August, August like 9th to 13th. I'll be in Israel the first week in August. Hopefully, uh, we'll be organizing events in Israel for me, uh, giving talks, doing stuff. My book is coming out in Hebrew, 
So we'll be doing some book-related events and try to get that out as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be good. All right, what else is going on? Um, I've got another sponsored show. I'll try to do it on Saturday. Uh, the title will be Fintech, Crypto, and the Future of Banking. So hopefully there's enough people interested in finance. Fintech, crypto, and, the, and I'm sticking crypto in basically as clickbait because what do I know about crypto? Fintech, crypto, and the future of banking. That'll be, that'll be the, the topic of Saturday's show. Uh, Thursday's show is a Q&A with uh, $25 supporters. Sunday's show is the Q&A with $100 supporters. Uh, I'm also moving, so all of this is going to happen while I'm moving, so hopefully um, I'll be able to do the show from the new place because it's all under construction. So, like, we got, we've got two rooms that we can use. Everything else is, is under construction. So uh, my wife and I will be, be, be limited to a, the guest bedroom and the, um, the office. And everything else is going to be under innovations. And uh, we're going to try to try to do it there. Um, uh, did I see Peter Schiff debate Richard Wolf? Uh, Richard would try to filibuster and talk over Peter. Would love to know what you thought of the debate between the two. <coughs> Excuse me. God. Uh, no, I haven't seen the debate. I'll watch it before I debate Richard. Uh, he's done a few. He, he did that one. He, he, he also debated um, Epstein, um, the, the guy debated on selfishness. So I watched both of those kind of as, as prep, as painful as both debates will be to watch. Uh, I'll watch both debates and be ready for Richard Wolf. It's going to be tough for him to speak over me. I'm sure it was tough for him to speak over Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff is no uh, shrinking violet. Is that the expression? So... Um, Ryan wants a show from the beach. I, can't, I don't think I can do a show from the beach, but I can do a show from my balcony, which is even more impressive than the beach. So if you'll tolerate doing the show over Wi-Fi, uh, we can try to do, maybe I can run a, actually, maybe I can even run an Ethernet cable um, onto the balcony. But I can do a show on from the balcony and show you the view from my balcony Better than the beach. I'm like, because the, because it'll be on the balcony, which is ten stories above the beach. So we'll just look down right in the into the ocean, from ten stories up. So, um, I mean, the new uh, the new condo is um, is pretty sweet. It's pretty amazing. It's like, it's like the culmination. It's it's great. It's a great place to spend the next ten years. Um, who knows what will happen after that, but it's a great place to be spending the next 10 years. So Ryan, Ryan has just provided seven Canadian dollars for a balcony because he's from Canada, and in Canada, there's like two months you can go out on the balcony because the rest of the time the weather's too bad. It's way too cold to be on the balcony. So yes, a balcony is, is, a, is an exotic place. Particularly a balcony over water, is an, uh, over an ocean, is an exotic place for... Uh, Canadians. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan. You know I hate cold weather, so I had a I had a, a, a sneak a, a, a little thing on Canada. All right, Ryan says it's true. He says it's true. All right, what else can I tell you in order to avoid talking about politics? <laughs> so the reason this came to me. Is, um, is primarily watching the Democratic Party and, and uh, during this latest um, war in Israel, between Israel and Hamas. And what's become evident, and has become evident for years now, but it's become, I think, I think it was stark uh, during this conflict, is how far to the left the Democratic activists are even as compared or as compared to their congressional representatives or to the president of the United States from their own party. So you have Biden, who's kind of a traditional Democrat. He doesn't really stand for much. He's a moderate, a centrist, 
a middle of the road, a, a compromise, a, a, a nothing in, in many respects. And he basically holds kind of traditional democratic views. So when, when a crisis happens in Israel, generally he's going to be supportive of Israel. Not too much, but generally so, just as, you know, every democratic president, you know, like Clinton has been in the past. Even, even Jimmy Carter. You know, not, not over the top. But just when push comes to shove, uh, Biden, during this last uh, uh, little war, kept saying Israel has a right to defend itself. Didn't put really a lot of pressure on Israel to have a ceasefire until like 11 days in, and then it wasn't a really big push. And, and I think generally on, on issues of race, on issues of uh, cultural war, on issues of the economy, Biden traditionally has been a very much a middle of the road. I mean, Obama took him as vice president because he represented the center, and Obama was afraid that he was too associated in people's minds with the far left. So he was the moderating force. But almost all of the uh, Democrats in the House of Representatives and even in the Senate were way to the left of uh, way to the left of Biden on the Israel issue. They came out and condemned Israel, took a pretty strong pro-Palestinian stance, and it wasn't even uh, congressional leaders. It's the activists, the, the the BLM activists, the Silicon Valley activists. I don't know if you saw this. Um, uh, 1,000 Apple employees wrote a letter to the CEO demanding that Tim Cook take a stand on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I, I, assuming on the Palestinian side, right? And now 1,000 is less than 1%, right? Because there are 150,000 employees at Apple. So 1,000 is not that impressive. But they're the vocal 1,000, the, the activists. I did a show a few weeks ago about the fact that, on the, uh, that the, 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 at the extremes, that's where you get the activism. That's where you get the activists. That's where you get the loud voices. That's where you get the people who are engaged. That's where you get all the nonsense in Silicon Valley. It's not... Most employees in Silicon Valley are nutty woke. No, it's the thousand at Apple. But the, that thousand are the ones who make the noise. They're the ones who get engaged. They're the ones who write the letters. They're the ones who put pressure. They're the ones who pound, pound the desk. They're the passionate ones. And indeed, in that sense, Democratic activists are far more active than the Republican activists, and Democratic activists are far more numerous than the Republican activists. So the, the, the activists, the politicians, I think, because of the activists, the intellectuals, the democratic intellectuals, the, the intellectuals on the left, have all moved away from the center in dramatic fashion, both on Middle East issues, on race issues with Black Lives Matter, on economic issues with MMT, Medicare for All, and a whole slew of uh, government interventions, ex dramatic expansion of the welfare state, and massive expansion of central planning. Again, way away from the Biden, even way to the left of Obama, certainly left of Clinton and, and past Democrats. And of course, this is all completely predictable. This is all completely predictable. That is that the center cannot hold. The center is not a position. The center doesn't stand for anything. The center must fold to the people who have an ideal, who stand for something, who believe in something, who want something. 
Now, they don't fold immediately. It can take decades for the center to fold. I mean, Ayn Rand talked about this in the 60s and the 70s, that the moderates were nothing. And therefore, the, the, the principled opposition uh, on the radical sides would ultimately dictate the direction of any political party. And we're seeing that. I'm talking about Democrats now, but we'll see that with the Republicans as well. Exactly the same thing is happening and will only get worse. So it's not that Biden is not in charge. Biden is in charge and he's trying to tow a kind of moderate line on some issues like Israel. He towed the line. He, he, he kept to it. He didn't fold to the progressives. On economic issues, he's folded more. On some of the culture's issues, he's folded more. But not, not completely. This is not a nutty, progressive, way out there left socialist administration, but it's a, it's a far more leftist administration than what you would expect just from looking at Biden's record. It's far to the left of Biden. And that makes sense because the Democratic Party is far to the left of where it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. So the Democratic Party has drifted towards its most radical to most extreme elements. The elements that are most consistent with its collectivism, most consistent with the altruism, most consistent with the statism that the Democratic Party has always stood for, but that is now much more consistently advocated for by kind of the far left within the party. And as much as people like Biden resist it, and, and I'd say even more so, uh, what's her name from Arizona, Democratic senator from Arizona who's voted against the minimum wage and increases and other things. There are a few Democratic senators in particular who are trying to resist that, and we'll talk about why they're trying to resist it in a minute, partially because of ideology, but not only. But they can't hold. The center cannot hold. They have nothing to stand on. They have no basis for their ideas. There's only one reason that they can somehow sustain themselves. Yeah, her name is uh, Cinema from Arizona. And that reason is that what's happening in the Democratic Party is that the activists and that the left-leaning um, left uh, progressive politicians are way, 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 way to the left of the American people. That they cannot win on this platform. The more they go left, the more they go towards the collectivism, the racism, the socialism, the statism of AOC and the rest of the leftist agenda, the more they lose the American public. The majority of Americans are not significantly to the left of Biden. Biden won the presidency not because of his leftist agenda. He won the presidency because he was viewed as a moderate. And he won the presidency because people hated Trump so much. It was not an affirmation of AOC. Indeed, the, re, the, the Democrats did terribly in the House of Representatives and did a lot worse than expected with the exception of Georgia, which I think Trump single-handedly lost for the Republicans. With the exception of Georgia, they did poorly in the Senate. The American people did not embrace the far-left agenda of the Democratic Party. 
they embraced a kind of centrist stand for nothing agenda. And the only thing that gives centrist, the centrist politicians anything, any kind of say within the Democratic Party is because the fact is they represent the majority of Democratic voters. Not the thousand Apple employees who wrote a letter to Tim Scott to make a statement about Israel, but the 149,000 people who didn't sign that letter, or let's say 60% of them who are probably Democrats, are not way out there on the left. So the Democratic Party as a party is drifting away from where Americans are. And of course, more importantly, it's drifting away from what America is. And I want to say a few things about what America is before we get to talking about the Republicans. What is America? What do I mean drifting away from America? Well, partially, it's that they're drifting away from where the core of American people are. But more importantly is they're drifting away from the principles on which this country was founded. They're drifting away from the idea of America, from the principle that is America. America is the first and maybe only country founded on a moral, ethical principle. On the principle of individual rights. On the principle of individual liberty and freedom. On the principle that every individual is free. Free to pursue his values based on his mind, free of coercion, free of interference, free of control, free of authority. Rights sanction every individual's action in pursuit of their value. You don't need permission to act, to start a business, to employ people, to sell a product, to go to the beach without a mask. The point of rights is you don't need permission. If they want to limit you, they have to show how your action is dangerous, how your action violates somebody's rights. So, the left today has no conception of rights, has no interest in the concept of rights, has no conception of freedom or liberty. The primary is, as it always is, the kind of the idea of a, a public interest, the social well being. We appoint authorities to dictate what that means and they dictate how we live they want to dictate what we think or at least what we say they want to dictate how we behave and indeed they want to penalize us for the color of our skin they want to penalize us for being successful they want to penalize us for having wealth so this is a political party not focused on rights and liberty and freedom, but a political party for the most part focused on control and on sacrifice. And in that sense, it's an anti-American political party. It's a political party that's moved away from the principles of America, away from what makes America great, from what make, for wakes, sorry, for what makes America America. And all of this, from, from the critical race theory to inequality, to their love of the Palestinian cause, all of it, all of these ideas are completely counter 
to the ideas of the Enlightenment that made America possible, to the idea of America as it was conceived originally. Now, it is true. There are real issues. I always say this. There are real issues of race. I'm not a, a racism denier. Uh, and the, the, the historical injustices. And there is an issue about why the poor don't, are not getting out of poverty faster. And there's an issue with the Palestinians. But it's not the issues that they raise. And certainly their solutions are not solutions to any kind of real problems. Their solutions always involve sacrifice, always involve less freedom, always involve more government intervention, more control, more authority. Their solutions involve guilt, which is the basis on which they ask you to sacrifice. So it's sad. When uh, Ayn Rand criticized the Democratic Party, it used to, she used to say, they want to control your economic activity because they're materialists and that's what's important to them. But they want to leave you free when it comes to, in a sense, your spiritual life, your life of the mind, uh, life in the bedroom, your sexuality, everything else. But even that's not true anymore. They used to be the party of free speech. Not anymore. They're clearly antagonistic to free speech. They used to be a party of, at least on some issues, leave people alone, have their own opinion. Now you have to follow dogma. You have to do what they tell you to do. Behave the way they tell you to behave whether it's towards minorities, towards um, LBT, GTQ+, whatever, which are now the heroes and everyone else is abnormal and should feel guilty for being normal or abnormal. Or I'm not sure how it goes. So today they want to control all sides of your life. The Democratic Party today is a lot worse than it was uh, under Ayn Rand, during Ayn Rand's time, even during the 60s. In a sense that the radicals today or the far left is far worse than the far left back in the 60s, far more nihilistic, far more egalitarian. Now again, I don't think that's where Democratic voters are. But that's where the far left is. That's who puts the pressure, the activists are. That's who put the pressure on politicians. And that, ultimately, that pressure. And because they stand for something. And because they are willing to be consistent on their stand, the more moderate forces are inclined to move in that direction. And long term, it is the far left that will set the terms for the Democratic Party, not the center, even though the far left, until they, they lose so many votes that there'll be some recalibration politically, right? And that's where you get this pendulum. It's not an ideological pendulum. It's a pendulum that when, when the party gets so far away from the American people, it has to realign itself again because it has to get the votes. But for that, there has to be another party who wins. And this is the thing about the Democratic Party right now. I think there's a good chance they lose the midterm elections and they lose the House and maybe the Senate to the Republicans. Not because the Republicans are doing such a great job. Not because the Republicans are where the American people are or what the American people want. It's because the Democratic Party, because of its far left influence, is so alienating to the American people, so divorced 
from the real concerns of the American people and the worries and the issues that they care about. They're so obsessed with transgender, they're so obsessed with Palestinians, they're so obsessed with critical race theory, with intersectionality, who's more oppressed than whom, that the American people cannot relate to them. This is why I've said I, I don't think the Democrats can win big in America. They're too un-American. So even though I think the Republican Party, as I'll say in a minute, is completely corrupt and completely bankrupt and stands for nothing, I think people will rebel against the leftist tilt of the Democratic Party. Now, there's a long time before elections, but there's a chance that people will rebel against that and vote for the Republicans. Not because they love the Republicans, because they can't stand the Democrats. It's also true that the party in power typically loses the midterm election. But the Republicans are so pathetic right now. The Republicans are alienating the American people so much right now. The Republicans are doing such stupid things right now that you would think that they wouldn't have a chance. You'd think that they're going to get crushed in the midterm election in spite of the fact that Demo Democrats ain't power. But that's probably not the case because as bad as the Republicans are, from an American perspective, from an average American perspective, I think the Democrats are worse. Now, a lot will depend on the economy. And the economy is not doing great, as I predicted. A lot will depend on the economy. Right. So let's look at the Republican Party vis-a-vis -vis America. The ideas of liberty, the ideas of individual rights, the idea of freedom. The Republican Party has completely lost its way. Not that it had a particular good way in the last 50 years or since Reagan, let's say. But it, whatever way it had, it has lost it completely. Trump took it off the track and way away from America. He caused a massive drift away from the principles of America. There is no, nobody in, a, in the Republican Party talks about rights anymore, or the Constitution anymore, or limited government anymore, or the principle of, you know, separation of powers. All Republicans care about today is attacking the left and not being the left. Now, maybe that's a winning strategy in the short run. It's not a governing strategy. It's not a strategy that is going to move us towards freedom. But maybe the Democrats are so bad, so have so alienated the American people that Republicans can win on a platform that says, we're not them. Maybe that works. I'm not enough of a political strategist to know. But when you look at this political party that refuses to take, to examine, never mind take responsibility for what happened January 5th, that completely is groveling before Donald Trump on every issue, folding on him, even people who are critical of Trump, folding on him, and he's not even president. A political party with no soul, no ideas, no agenda. It turns out that to combat Biden's $2.2 trillion infrastructure project, uh, program, which, as I talked about, not much, some infrastructure, a lot of just social spending, Republicans counted $400 billion of infrastructure, which still is way more. How are you going to... How do you, where do you raise the money from? Biden countered with 1.7 trillion. And the last I heard is Republicans are going to counter with a trillion dollars. So we're not, we haven't spent enough trillions. A 
according to the Democratic Party and according to the Republican Party. In the challenge, in the discussion about minimum wages, two Republicans offered alternatives to the Democratic proposals for minimum wage. Not to set them at zero, but to set them at just lower numbers or different methodology to measure them. One by Mitt Romney, you'd expect a moderate or seemingly moderate Republican. And the other by, um, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> Hawley. Who is considered the future of conservatives. Democrats want to grow the state. Republicans say, yeah, we do too. A little slower and without raising taxes. That's the most important issue for Republicans of all. It's taxes. It's not liberty. It's not freedom. It's not liberty, limited government. It's all about taxes. All they care about. All they obsess about. So, the Republicans today, the most influential portion of the Republican Party, the ones who uh, attract the intellectuals, the ones that write and, and write papers and are proposing solutions and are proposing ideas and are proposing legislation, they're all the national conservatives. They're all nationalists, statists, central planners, who want to expand the state in the name of American greatness. And yet, it's not about America. It's, 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 it's Tucker Carlson's America. Tucker Carlson's America is the America with beautiful scenery and strong religion. It's a Republican Party more dedicated to the fight against abortion than ever before. You thought that because Trump was secular, which he is, abortion wouldn't matter, but it's huge. You've got a case in front of the Supreme Court now. Texas just passed a law restricting abortion after 15 weeks. Heartbeat rule, I guess. And they're just getting started. This is, this is their passion. So... A Republican Party that is not interested, is interested in religion, interested in, quote, religious liberty, not in liberty, not in freedom, not in capitalism or markets, low taxes and regulate and control and, uh, and, and raise tariffs and uh, manage production, and manage the economy all you want. And yet, they might win. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if Trump won in 2024 if the economy is doing badly. But not just the Republican nomination, the election. So... We've got a Republican Party that over the last five, six years have been drifting away from America. Now, it has been drifting away from America forever, just like the Democratic Party. But that drift on both sides has accelerated over the last five years. Most Americans, I still think, are not on the side of America. But they're not drifting to those extremes either. They're somewhere in the middle. I don't think they know what America is. I don't think they would recognize what America is. I'm not even sure they would respond to an America-promoting agenda. So a, a, a proper political party that stood for the founders, for the Constitution, for 
the principle of individual rights, even if they didn't fully understand what it meant. I don't think most Americans would stand for that. But they know that something's wrong with the Republicans, and they know something's wrong with the Democrats. They know that those ideas are corrupt, are wrong, are bad. I mean, I don't particularly like Liz Cheney. I, I never liked her father uh, to the extent that she is a copy of her father, and I don't know she is. I mean, I think she's, she's moderately better than her father. But I, I never liked Dick Cheney uh, as vice president. Maybe he wasn't that bad of a congressman. He was considered at the time extremely conservative, not a middle-of-the-road Republican at all, but extremely conservative. He was not a neocon. Uh, in spite of everybody labeling him a neocon, he was not traditionally a neocon and, and did not ascribe to many of the neocon ideas. And Again, I wrote a book about neoconservatives, critical of them. And yet, all Liz Cheney had to do was say something like, you know, we need to stop with this lie about the election being stolen, and they vote out of leadership. Basically, making it clear, if you don't stand with Trump, not just generally with Trump, now Trump is not president anymore. They don't have to do this. If you don't stand with Trump, including all of his irrationalities, including all of his lies, including all the deceptions, including all the conspiracies. If you don't stand with him, then you are not going to be in a leadership position in the Republican Party. Now again, they're responding to the activists. And maybe in the Republican Party, the activists are a larger number than the Democratic Party. I have a feeling that is true. They're quieter, they're less engaged, they're less vocal, they don't write as many letters, but I think there are more of them. They're responding to the 53% of Republicans, this is a number I saw today, that still think that Trump won the election. But by doing so, they're giving up on truth. They're giving up on the soul, if the Republican Party had a soul. They're giving up on every principle. They're basically becoming the party of Trump with everything that represents. And when that fails, and it will fail, when that implodes, and it will implode, it won't be free marketers who win. It won't be free marketers who replace these Trump puppets. It'll be the nationalists, the religionists, the, the, the people who can capitalize on Trump's irrationality by being even bigger statists than he is. And in that sense, all of it, in that sense, the entire Republican Party will be drift far away from Americanism what America is, what America was, what America represents, and I think from where a majority of Americans are. And that's happening to both political parties. And the real question is what's going to happen? Intellectually, what's going to happen politically as this? Is there a third party that arises? I don't see it. Are there countervailing forces that are going to drive the parties back? Maybe, short run? But as Ayn Rand said, moderation, standing for nothing, being Mitt Romney, is not a position. It's not sustainable. It's not an equilibrium. I'm just a little bit of an altruist versus I'm consistently an altruist. The consistent altruist will move the little bit altruist constantly in his direction. The people who stand for something will always get the others to compromise. It's the middle of the road who compromise with the principles. Not the principled ones. They stick to it. And you can see that in both political parties. And again, it's not that the Republicans have principles right now. The only principle is Trump. But it's by selling all their principles down the drain. 
When that fails, the ones with the principles will be the statists, the national conservatives, the central planners, and then the rest of the Republicans will have nothing, nothing to offer to stand up against them. There's nobody in the Republican Party right now standing for the principles of the founders, for the principles of the Constitution, for the principles of individualism and individual rights. Nobody. Both parties are adrift away from America, away from the principles, away from where what the future, what America deserves in terms of a future, which is freedom, capitalism, liberty. All right, let's see. What do Marxist socialists that you have debated typically try to wrap their failed philosophy to make it more palatable? Humanism would be one, worker equity in name of social justice another, any other go-to tactics. I mean, generally their argument is, uh, you know, the, the, the better ones, is that socialism is the way for people to actually be free. Socialism is the way for people to actually gain from all the material wonders that are being produced by capitalists. And that indeed socialism will bring about better gains for individuals if it's tried, if it's practiced properly. Properly, right? So yeah, humanism is a big one. Worker equity, but they don't believe in workers, right? Because they believe that the, I mean, in a sense that they believe all workers should be owners. The workers should own the means of production. I mean, the woman I debated last week claimed that Marx believed in, in, in human happiness and human freedom and individual freedom and you know, that once we solve the problem of material production, which capitalism has solved, we all get to do our own thing, complete in freedom. Now, she's evading huge quantities of material, both in Marx, but also in just what a world like that actually looks like. She's evading, for example, that somebody has to produce stuff, and that production primarily happens in the mind. So they're materialists. And they believe in the labor theory of value, and that's an important part of their whole ideology. So it's, it's all about, in their mind, justice, morality, equity. Even, you know, she was all about human flourishing. You know, workers cannot flourish because they're stuck in a job, and they don't get paid based on their production. They get paid less than what they produce. So they're being exploited. Give them the opportunity to stop being exploited. They will flourish and they will do phenomenally well. How? Blank. At whose expense? Blank. What happens to entrepreneur came up with the idea? Blank. They just don't answer. They have no answer. Younger Democratic voters heavily voted for hard left progressives. They want a Europe welfare state. If AOC can get a Senate seat in New York, it will serve as a launching pad for a presidential run in 8 to 12 years from now. Maybe. But you see, younger voters are always more left than older voters. And then they grow up and they become less left as they grow older. So it's not clear that you can generate a majority just because this, that generation was very leftist doesn't mean that in 10 years they'll still be that leftist. Indeed, history suggests that they won't be. I don't think AOC will be president. I certainly don't think AOC will be president unless she radically modifies her ideas. Now, who knows, 12 years from now, where the country is. But 70% of Americans hate AOC despise her ideas, maybe 80. She is not where the American people are. 
Now, maybe she's with the American people will be in 12 years, but I'm not convinced of that. I think the American people have other priorities. I, I've said this many, many times. You're not going to get a majority of Americans to vote for you if you tell them they should feel guilty for the color of their skin, if you tell them they're racist because they're white. So you're just not going to win that way. You can guilt a lot of people. A lot of people support it. You can make a lot of noise. You can cancel some people. Uh, you know, you can play your elite games and elite institutions and schools and other places. But the vast majority of Americans are just not going to accept it. Don't you see a civil war between Trumpists and never Trump GOPers at some point in the next four years? Liz Cheney has talked about taking a poison pill and running for president to make sure Trump never gets elected. You mean running for president as an independent? Because if she runs for president in the Republican Party, she would lose big time, right? So, no, I mean, there is a civil war. It's going on right now. But the sad reality is, and to me it's very sad, but it is the sad reality, is that the never Trumpers are insignificant. They have no base of support. They're often intellectuals. They have maybe a readership. But they're no activists. They're no, they're no people who are going to go demonstrate against Trump from the Republican Party. There's just no passion there. And what do they stand for? They're against Trump. Some of them are against Trump because they're pro-free markets and they're, you know, maybe on the individualist side and so on. Some of them hate Trump because they're just centrist and moderates and they think uh, Trump is too, I don't know, extreme or whatever. The vast majority of Americans are not, are not living in fear of being canceled, fired, demoted, and dead-ended. A small minority of people live in fear of that. There's zero evidence that a vast majority of Americans be there. I mean, uh, somebody working in a factory in Des Moines, Iowa, is not concerned about being canceled. He's concerned about making a living and feeding his family. Never Trumpers are Republicans, yes. I just don't see enough never Trumpers. And I don't see them powerful enough, and I don't see them having a constituency that would challenge the Trumpists for the Republican Party. Right now, the Republican Party is Trump's party. And the only alternative right now to, to Trump are the Josh Hawleys of the world, who will support Trump for as long as he serves their purposes. I mentioned Nikki Haley was good. I, I, I think she has been good. But she's not a never-Trumper. And she's not fighting Trump. She's trying to have it both ways. And I, I think Trump has written her off. And therefore, I don't think she has a future. I, I said this all along, that unless Trump loses in decisive action, people like Liz Cheney will not be the future of the Republican Party. Somebody like DeSantis is, is playing the Trump card. Does he have policies that are originally his? Does he have policies that move us towards liberty and freedom? Yes, he did well with COVID. But beyond that, does he have any more? Does he have anything that he really, really stands for that, that is different than where the Republican Party is today? So I don't know about a civil war. Civil war has to have two committed part, uh, sides. And in the civil war right now within the Republican Party, only the Trumpists seem committed. The anti-Trumpists, I mean, every single Republican political leader is going down and kissing Donald Trump's ring. So yeah, you would think 
that Donald Trump being a loser would eradicate his appeal, but by propagating the lie that the election was stolen from him, he is pretending not to be a loser. Now, you know, remember, under Trump, the Republicans lost the House. Under Trump, the Republicans lost the Senate. Under Trump, the Republicans lost the presidency. He is a loser. And even if you, even if you assume that it was stolen, why didn't he prevent it from being stolen? He, he kept saying it was going to be stolen. Why didn't he prevent it? He's a loser by every measure. But it doesn't seem to register among the Republican voters. I mean, a significant number of them say that they will vote for him, that he is their lead candidate for the 2024 election. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe in six months, Trump will really have disappeared. Maybe he's going to get into legal problems, which he might, and, and, and be irrelevant in the Republican Party because of that. We will see, and, and that'll be great if that happens. I will celebrate that. That'll be fantastic. And maybe then a Republican Party can rebuild itself and be better. But so far, he is very much in the center of things within the Republican Party. All right, those were the $20 questions. Just to remind everybody, uh, Alejandrina's goal for every show is $400. I know last show we did like a birthday thing and we got all the way to $1,000. So I know some of you are pretty cash poor right now. But, you know, Alejandrina has her goals and, and, uh, and she's driven we're at $115, so we've got $300 to go. I'm sure some of you can help her out to get, uh, to get, to, uh, to get to her goal for the night. Um, I don't want to make this a four-hour show so we get there. So uh, uh, you know, help her out. Help her out. And, and if anybody wants to give, you know, if any of, any of the old whales wants to come in and just give a, a, a big sum to... To, to, make the, to make this a shorter appeal, feel free to do it. Feel free to do it. All right, let's see. Um, what makes objectivism different from libertarian moral agnosticism who eternally say both sides are equally bad and hopes the left targets them last? I, I don't hope the left targets me last. I mean, I, the, the left and the right are both targeting me. I, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it, I'm, it's not about strategically avoiding being targeted for objectivists. And objectivists are not moral agnostics. Objectivists call evil when they see it, wherever they see it. The difference is we're not agnostic. We have a position. The left today is evil. The right today is evil. That's a strong, committed, moral position, not agnostic. It's not, life is not a series of choices between two things. That's bizarre. There's not just vanilla and chocolate. There isn't. And sometimes that's the only choice. You walk another couple of blocks until you find strawberry or coconut or something else. So, no. I don't accept the idea that I'm criticizing Republicans so that the left will leave me alone. And I don't accept the idea that you have to choose between left and right, otherwise you're morally agnostic. On the contrary, you're a moral compromiser, a moral sellout. if you don't call it the way you see it, if you don't call evil wherever you see evil. So I know, and I've pointed this out many, many times, that people can only think in twos. You've got this option or that option, that's it. No, I've got a third option, fourth option. I could not vote, I could vote for Libertarian. I can move to a different country. I can do a lot of things with my life. I don't have to choose between Democrats and Republicans if I think they both suck. And, and just to remind you that Ayn Rand didn't vote for Ronald Reagan. 
And she didn't vote for Jimmy Carter either. She abstained. Because she thought they were both morally bad. And it wasn't because she was afraid of the left. She had fought the left her entire life. But she thought Ronald Reagan would be an abomination, would destroy the Republican Party, destroy whatever good was in the Republican Party. All right. Um, capitalist Nick asks, DeSantis stood up on ideological grounds for keeping CRT out of the schools. Don't you think young, charismatic, 45-year-old DeSantis who is ideological, would be formidable to an empty vessel like 78-year-old Trump. Now, I, I, I don't know enough about the Santis to know whether he is truly ideological and whether his ideology is any good. But let's say it is. Then I hope so. But I'm not sure because I, I, I think people... People's attitude towards Trump is that they like his character. It's not about his policies. They like the fact that he's an empty vessel. I mean, some people, not everybody who voted for Trump, of course. Many people voted for Trump because he wasn't the left, just like many people voted for Biden because he wasn't Trump. But... I'm curious to see how DeSantis runs. I, I mean, DeSantis also signed this bill that penalizes, um, penalizes social media companies who deplatform a politician. That is, on so many levels, such an awful piece of legislation that Republicans in Florida came up with. It's a violation of freedom of speech. It's, it's why are politicians special? They can deplatform a, a common person, but not a politician. Politicians are special. This is, uh, they're, they're aristocrats. They were a, a ruling class. That's DeSantis, not me. So, no. Now, I, I respect DeSantis because of what he did around COVID. And, and the fact that he did stand up to CRT. But what does he stand for? What are his positive views? Is he for regulating, breaking up big tech? I'm pretty sure he is. I'm not going to support anybody who uh, stands for breaking up big tech. Democrat or Republican. Can't vote for people like that. They're all statist. I, I like that term by Richard. Statist aristocracy. Statist aristocracy. And it's on the left and it's on the right. It's, it's, it's the people who just want to hold on to power and wield power over your lives. And maybe they start out good and maybe they have some good ideas, but power is corrupting. And absolute power is absolute corruption. CRT is critical race theory. Did I say CLT? I apologize. Fred Kinnan. I don't know who Fred Kinnan is. Not a good guy, but I like him and wanted to know more. If he's not a good guy, why do you like him? Any thoughts on his character, purpose, relevancy? Restaurant is very busy, so I'll need at least a few weeks' notice before you come. Oh, um, so I'll give you the best notice I can. Uh, this is New York. Um, I read the review of your restaurant. Wow. I'm very, very, very eager to come. Very eager to come. Um, it's really now, I'm hoping to come to New York in June, but I, I, I really can't commit to a date yet. And as soon as I do, I will let you know because I'm very eager to come and eat at your restaurant. It sounds exciting. It sounds just like the food I love. So um, I'm excited. Remind me who Fred Kinnan, Kinnan is. Um, and, and maybe I can actually answer or comment on your question. Uh, and I'm glad the restaurant's busy. I mean, you got a great review in the New York Times, so I'm glad the restaurant is busy. Uh, it sounds like you deserve that. 
Okay, Starjet says, DeSantis is anti-life, anti-capitalism, and anti-free speech. He is pro-G. I'm not sure what G stands for. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to make a, a note uh, to contact you once I know the date of the, the, my trip to New York. Uh, let's see. Other questions that are related to the topic before we move on to my review of the secretary, the movie, the uh, secretary. Um, all right, we'll do all these. These are non-20 dollar questions. We'll do these at the end. Um, let me just again remind you, uh, we need about 200 and a bit dollars to get to our goal to make Alejandrina happy. Remember, she's in Venezuela. Um, there's not that many uh, sources. Oh, I'm sorry. Kenan was the union representative in Atlas, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, the thugs, often the thugs, the, the brutes, the mafia, are much more honest about their use of force than the intellectuals, the elites, the politicians who are using just as much force on you. But they try to make you think that it's in your self-interest. They try to make you think that it's benign. They try to make you think you really want it. So I think the crook, in a sense, the, the materialistic thug is at least honest. You know what's going to happen. He tells you in advance. He's going to break your legs. <laughs> right? You cross him, your legs get broken. And he, he, he's not... He's not trying to pretend that... And, and to pretend otherwise. And that's why he's a... Not a likable character in, um, in Atlas Shrugged, but a character that at least is honest and at least is real and at least you know how to deal with him. Right? He's coming at you with a gun. Shoot him first. The politician is coming at you with a bazooka, with an anti-tank missile. But it's disguised as flowers. And you don't know until you're flat on the back with a big hole in your chest that that's what he intended to do to you. And, he, and all the time, all the while, he's going to tell you this is for the good of society. The thug doesn't pretend it's for the good of society. He just wants his bucks. He just wants his money. He just wants his stuff. And that's what makes him realer, more honest. And that's why I think you, you, you have a, a somewhat positive reaction to him in Atlas. Thank you, uh, Florida Henry. Thank you, Zalmi. Um, thank you, Cook, uh, for your, your guys' contributions. All right, 185 bucks. Uh, we've still got more than halfway to go. $20 questions get priority, $50 get super priority, $100 get super, super, super priority. I might even stop in the middle of a sentence to answer your question if it's got $100 associated with it. <coughs> okay, let's talk about secretary. So, spoiler alert, I don't think it's that big of a deal in this movie, it's not exactly a suspense movie. Um, so I'm going to talk about the plot. It's hard to talk about a movie without talking about a plot. So what's this story about? It's about a woman who is clearly psychologically damaged. She cuts herself. She cuts herself on her leg. She takes a razor blade and cuts herself to feel the pain. And if you read about people who cut themselves, the pain, the, 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 the idea is that they have so much internal pain that the only way to make them feel like there's hope 
is to create external pain and then watch the wound that they've created heal. And that gives them hope that their internal pain can heal as well. I read this online. I don't, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know. But there's something, they externalize the pain that they feel inside. And it's, it's sad, it's tragic, it's horrible, it's, it's, it's depressing. And you actually see her going into the motion of cutting herself, which is quite upsetting to me anyway. Um, anyway, she, the movie starts with her coming out of an institution where she has been treated, but it becomes evident within five, ten minutes that she is not cured. And she goes back to her whole habits that when her parents fight or when her father says something terrible or whatever, she goes to her room and cuts herself. But at some point, she decides she needs to get a job. And she, she goes and trains and she uh, typing school and she, she can type really well. So she goes and looks for a job as a secretary and she, and she gets a job uh, uh, on a secretary. And, and, and you know, there, there's a certain element of humor in the movie. Like this, it's, it's a lawyer's office and the lawyer has a big sign outside and it says secretary, like vacancy sign. And when the lights are on, it means yeah, I guess uh, he's hiring, or when the lights are off, he's got somebody, and it's, so it's kind of humorous because he's constantly rehiring secretaries. And the reason he constantly rehires secretaries is because he's weird and ultimately damaged and defective himself. And the movie is really about their relationship. She needs to feel pain. He is defective psychologically, needs to feel in control. And part of feeling in control is inflicting pain. So they develop a sadomasochistic relationship in which he spanks her, uh, he, he ties her up, he, he does different things to her. Um, I guess, Fifty Shades of Grey before, without Fifty or without Shades or without, or, or whatever, pre, uh, much earlier and much less explicit, I think, in, in the sex at least. Um, and the movie's basically that relationship. She has another relationship with a man, but that's kind of more normal, if you will. And this man actually offers to marry her and at some point at some point, she's even a wedding dress, although she never gets married. Um, but even this guy who she's going to marry is weird, repressed, clumsy, no self-esteem, no self-confidence. So my problem with the movie is I didn't like anybody. I didn't care about anybody. I couldn't have cared less what happened to any of these characters. All of them are flawed. Flawed in ways that I don't find particularly interesting. Flawed in ways that I can't really learn anything about myself or about other people in particular. The relationship between the lawyer and her is, okay, you know, it's satisfying to the two of them but in a sick, unhealthy, perverted way. And the movie ends, basically, and this is the theme of the movie, basically, is accepting who they are, accepting the nature of their relationship, and making the most of it. And it's kind of a happy ending. <laughs> because they don't compromise. They stick to them, sadomasochism, and that's the life they're going to live. And they're going to create all kinds of games around it. But that's not happiness. It's not healthy. They both need psychological help. They both need to see a therapist. They both need to rethink their lives. They both need to get out of the shell that they live in. They both need to be healthy. So I don't like these people. I don't find what they do interesting. I don't want to be in their universe. 
So basically, I found the movie boring. It, it wasn't sensual, stimula stimulating in, a, in that kind of way. It was pff, nothing. It wasn't sexy. Um, it was about a couple of sick people, I guess, dealing with their sickness and living with it. Not overcoming anything. Not fighting for values unless you consider the value their sickness in a sense. So yeah, she doesn't marry the guy which would be a compromise. She goes back to the guy who, who spanks her. Right? That's not a value orientation, not a pro-life value orientation. Not really. Now, there are some good things about the movie, in spite of everything that I said. The movie is beautifully shot, and it's very stylized. It's, it's stylized, it's um, essentialized. There's no unnecessary stuff in it. It's very focused on this theme of just, in a sense, be yourself, even if you're weird. Just go with it. A complete moral subjectivism. Um, the colors are beautiful. Very, very sharp colors, particularly in the lawyer's office. Not so much in the rest of the world. But in the lawyer's office, life has, it, it, where the sadomasochism happens, life perception is sharper, more clear, colors are more vivid, Life is being lived. And in that sense, I'd say the movie is well integrated around the theme. It's, uh, this movie's 2002. It's a 2002 movie. I saw it because somebody paid me $500 to review it. So it's, I, it's not a movie I would have seen unless somebody paid me to see it. So uh, and generally, if you want me to review a movie... Um, it's 500 bucks. I'll comment on movies just in the Q&A, like somebody's asking me about Chocolat and the English Patient. I'll comment on those because I, I've seen the movies. Um, but if I actually have to see the movie and do a whole review of it, like I just did, I'm going to have to... That's 500 bucks. Remember, if you want me to do a topic, if you want to tell me a topic I should do a whole show on, that's $1,000. Now, we are doing this thing where you can participate with a group of other people to determine a topic together and get to $1,000. So it doesn't just have to be one individual. I think right now we're doing it where you can contribute $100 to a show. Um, ultimately, we'll try to reduce it to even $20 or $50 you can participate in getting to the $1,000. Which reminds me, we're short $190 to get to the $400. And lastly, the acting, I think, is very good. Uh, it's, the movie has a whimsical side to it. It's not quite a comedy, but it's definitely whimsical. Uh, the, uh, the actress, the actress Maggie Gyllenhaal, is very good. She plays it whimsically. She plays it as if she's having fun as if the character's having fun. The whole idea is she's enjoying the spanking. But she's also plays it with bewilderment. Bewilderment. She's bewildered and excited. Not, not sexy at all. Not sexy at all. Um, James Spade is very good. He plays a very good repressed, emotionally detached uh, not completely aware of his own nature. He, he, he acts very well. And even the weird boyfriend, whose name I can't, actor I don't remember, it, it, you know, plays his part very well. So it's very well acted. It's very well directed. It's, as I said, the cinematography is good. It integrates well into its common theme. It's just, um, it's just not a movie I enjoyed and not a movie with positive values and not a movie that I think is worth seeing because as good as the acting is, as good as the cinematography is, 
I don't think it, it's good enough to justify living through the boring plot. And I found it boring. So. Sorry um, to those who liked it. But that's... You're going to get the honest opinion of my view on movies. Um, all right, quickly, just because it, we're on movie theme. Thoughts on the movie Chocolat and the English Patient? I love Chocolat. Uh, Chocolat's a, a really, really good movie. I think Leonard Peikoff did a review of Chocolat years and years and years ago. But it, it, it's excellent. Um, it's, um, it, it's just such a benevolent... Um, it's a French movie. Uh, maybe it was Juliette Binoche. And Juliette Binoche is just so... She's such a wonderful actress. She, she, she just... She's just wonderful to watch on screen. She's beautiful, but it's not the beauty. It's how she projects that beauty and what she does with it. And uh, just, a, 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 just She's just fantastic. And it was Johnny Depp, who plays, a, as usual, Johnny Depp, a very eccentric character. Uh, it's about, ultimately, a love story. But it's got this benevolence. There's an element of, of, of magic, magical realism to it. A little bit of implied mysticism. But that's not essential to the theme. And it's not what drives it, right? So I highly recommend Chocolat, as did Lena Peikoff when he reviewed it. It's just, a, I think we both watched it separately at the same time and both liked it. Um, it's, just a, it's just a wonderful, wonderful movie and, uh, and fun. It's Lasse Holstern, who's a good director. He's done some other things. Uh, let me see what else he's done. Um, Lasse Holstern. Let's see if I recognize any of the other movies he's done. Um, Yeah, maybe maybe I'm I'm being confused, but uh, Cider House Rules. But I don't really remember that movie very well. Anyway, I love Chocolat. I thought I saw one other good movie by him, but I love Chocolat and I, I highly recommend it. Right. Um, the other movie is The English Patient. Um, I didn't like The English Patient. It's too drawn out. It's beautiful. It's beautifully done. It's a magnificent love story. It's the pain and sacrifice and of love. So it's not a happy love story. Um, it's it's about an affair, if I remember right. Right. Um, I just found it too much. I saw. I think I saw it twice because it's a very good movie. It's very well made, beautifully acted. Uh, beautiful cinematography. So I'm, I'm, I'm and I, I can tolerate. I have a high tolerance for for movies. Uh, Ralph Fiennes. I'm not a huge Ralph Fiennes fan because he plays the same kind of repressed, suffering uh, um, character. Juliette Binoche. Again, I love her. So I probably watched it again because of her. And William Defoe. It's a good actor. It's Colin Firth. Um, good acting, beautiful, beautifully directed, beautifully made. Just, I found it too painful, too slow, too slow. Right. And it's, and it's, Stargett says it's mean. Yeah, it's mean to its characters. It's mean to its characters. So, yeah, again, if you like beautiful scenery, great acting, uh, beautiful cinematography. Then, then yeah, but it, it, yeah, no real plot, no real story, nothing to really embrace. The love story, just not that interesting. All right. Is the Belarus hijacking of the Ryanair jet an act of war? What ought the EU response be? And do you think that the West response to the murder of Jamal Ahmad Khashoggi gives Belarus the green light to commit its evil? That's a good point. I didn't think of the connection with Khashoggi. Um, you, 
yeah, it's an act of, it's, it's in a sense an act of war, uh, act of war against, not clear exactly against who, right, against the EU. The, the I, I, Ryanair, I guess, is a British company, so it's certainly a violation of, of British sovereignty, and 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 uh, it's it's a it's an act of war against Britain. Um, what should what should the EU and Britain do? Well, at the very minimal, they should withdraw their ambassador. They should renege on any diplomatic relations with Belarus. They should try to figure out if the Russians were involved. And, and treat the Russians the same way. Um, they should consider stopping all trade with Belarus. I don't think this rises to military invasion, military attack. They should immediately demand the release of the guy who was kidnapped off of the jet and reparations, damages, to be paid to all the um, other passengers on the jet that was diverted to Belarus, significant damages, and of course damages to Ryanair. So no, this is a big deal. Um, the murder of Jamal Ahmed Khashoggi should be treated the same way. This is a barbaric regime, the Saudis. Kagmushi, I don't think he was an American citizen. But he was a resident of the United States. He went to a Turkish, he went to Turkey, which is a NATO member. Now, he was murdered technically on Saudi Arabian soil because it was in the embassy, but he was lured there on false premises. And at the very minimum, it should be deemed as an act of barbarism. I mean, they literally chopped the guy up into pieces. And Saudi Arabia should be treated as a regime that does barbaric acts. Now, I don't think you need Jamal Ahmed Khashoggi's death to know that. The stoning of women, adulteresses, the chopping of thieves' hands off, the, the putting in jail for long periods of time of um, atheists, people who disagree with Islam on social media, should be enough to withdraw the American ambassador to have no relationship with Saudi Arabia, and to let them rot. And yes, the more weakness the West engages in, the more the various barbarians in the world will be emboldened. The more the various barbarians in the world will, will, will think that they can do whatever they want and everything's a go. Everything is sanctioned. Everything's okay. There are no consequences, at least no consequences, political Geopolitical consequences. All right, we're at two hundred and thirty-five dollars, hundred and sixty-five to go. Just saying. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've got nine questions, and then I'm done. We have to be at four hundred by then. Um, I will, of course, take more questions, particularly if the questions are. Um, $20 or more, and they get priority. And of course, by asking $20 or more questions, eight of those basically gets us there, right? Eight of those will be six short, and somebody will jump in with six bucks. So eight 20 bucks questions get priority. Oh, uh, Alejandrina is sad. There's actually an Alejandrina question here. It says, Alejandrina lives in Venezuela. Why does she move here where she belongs? I think that's an excellent question to ask Alejandrina. I'm curious about that as well. Why does she stay in Venezuela? Um, maybe she's saving up money so she can do it. And she gets a piece of uh, the super chat. So, you know, this is why she's so adamant about her 400 bucks. Maybe. Maybe that's what it will take. I don't know what it would take to get Alejandrina to leave Venezuela. Right? I don't know. Maybe she'll let us know in the chat. Because Venezuela is no place for somebody like Alejandrina. She's better than that. Right? Maybe she's a revolutionary. Maybe, maybe she's in the underground trying to fight for freedom and to free Venezuela. 
Did Plato want people to be miserable the way Kant did? No, no. The idea of being miserable is not part of, I don't think part of Plato, no. I'm not a Plato expert, but no, he, he believed that people, he wanted people to be as, to flourish or to succeed or to be happy to the extent that they could to the extent that they could see the light, could see the truth, and to the extent that they couldn't, they need to be guided. They need to be told what to do, and that was the role of the philosopher king. It's to guide people towards, you know, the truth, towards greater self-knowledge and greater discovery. Now, Plato's a complex philosopher, and, I, and I'm not an expert, but there's no... I don't think there's a sense of wanting people to be miserable. He might argue that we are miserable because we're in this body, stuck in this body. I think Socrates at least said, we're stuck in this body and it's our soul that needs to be connected with, with, with true reality, with, with God in a sense. With, uh, and, and, and that's where we achieve happiness when that happens. And, and therefore we're stuck in this materialistic body and that prevents us from doing that. It's a little bit like Christianity. And Christianity is very, very platonic in, in a sense, very neoplatonic, very influenced by Plato's philosophy. I'm reading A Cave in the Light, um, which is a book I highly recommend, have for years, and I'm rereading it now. And while I'm sure professional philosophers and professional historians would probably have quibbles with it, I think it's excellent and I find it fascinating and He's got this project of trying to explain all of Western history through the lens of intellectual history, through the lens of the, of the influence these two philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, had on the world. And so far, I'm finding it fascinating, really, really interesting, and, and matches what I think. If the West, West commits suicide, does that mean Ayn Rand failed? No. It means we all failed. The West failed. Her goal wasn't primarily to save Western civilization. Her goal was to project the ideal man. Her goal was to be a success. Her goal was to write a bestseller. Her goal was to live a good life. Her goal was to improve the lives of the people around her, to change people's lives. And yeah, she also wanted to change Western civilization, or to save Western civilization, but that's not a primary goal. And the fact is that if the West commits suicide, then the West has failed. The people who commit suicide have failed, not Ayn Rand. It's not like she has a duty. It's not like she can force people to, to, to see her ideas. Who are these two? The book doesn't make the case, The Cave in the Light doesn't make the case that the only important philosophers are Plato and Aristotle. But it shows how Plato and Aristotle influenced everybody else, including Christianity, and all the early thinkers in Christianity. And therefore, the whole evolution of Christianity is shaped by, by primarily by Neoplatonists, but also people trying to integrate Aristotle into it. And there's a sense in which only those two matter in a sense that they influence everybody who comes after them. And then nobody else has that kind of influence. Nobody else shapes the world in that kind of way. And it certainly until Immanuel Kant, nobody has a systematic philosophy in the way Aristotle and Plato did that covers every aspect of human life, every major question, and who everybody afterwards has to relate their ideas to. Everybody afterwards is influenced by one of them or both of them. What do you make of the attitude, I don't sell myself, myself short, I sell the world short? Why sell anybody short? Well, I mean, some companies should be sold short because they, they deserve it. They're too expensive or they're just bad companies. 
But why the world? What is it about the world that deserves to be so so short? I, so I don't like attitudes like that where it just dismisses the world or the flip side dismisses self. So Alejandrina says she's currently saving money so she can find ways to renew her what? Renew her visa and stuff, her ability to leave. She needs to travel. She needs a passport. She needs to be able to bribe the right people in, in, um, in Venezuela so she can get a passport so she can leave. You know, statist regimes like Venezuela's don't, build, don't let people leave. So, yeah. You know, help her out if you can. What do you make of the... Oh, we did that. Don't we basically have a European welfare state in this country already? Um, no. I mean, we have, I don't know, three quarters, two thirds of a European welfare state. We don't have universal, we don't have um, socialized medicine yet. Not completely. We do for old people. We do for poor people, but not for everybody in the middle. We don't quite redistribute as much as the Europeans do. We're not as efficient at the welfare state as the Europeans are. We don't tax as high as the Europeans. But yeah, there's no difference in principle between us and Europe. In principle, we are the same. In principle, we have the same kind of status regime, welfare-based status regime. Uh, Americans generally regulate more, redistribute less. Europeans redistribute more, regulate less. Although Americans are redistributing more and Europeans are regulating more, so we're converging. Okay, real Mr. Meatball. I recently had a conversation with a PhD in racial studies. Why? What can you say to somebody who explicitly says they don't believe in private property? Don't say anything. Just take their pen, paper, clothes, backpack. See how they react. Um, there's certain people you can't have a conversation with. And... You gotta, you know, if somebody doesn't believe in private property, the question is why? What, what has led them to that belief? And usually is they don't believe in the individual. They believe only in the collective. They believe only in the group. They reject the individual and is, is the, the, the morality of individualism. It's only on the basis of individualism can you establish private property. I mean... Do conservatives believe in private property? Only up to a point. They still want to tax your property. So it's not really yours. You're renting it from the government. They still want to regulate you, even though it's your property. They want to tell you what you can and cannot build on it. They want zoning laws. So he's at least, in a sense, honest to say he doesn't believe in private property. Most people think they believe in private property, but they don't. The policies that they have don't. So you have to, what does it mean to say more than the left? They believe in private property more than the left. You either believe in it or you don't. Nobody in American politics believes in private property. They say they do, but they don't. Not in their actions. So yes, the, the, the right wants to act on it less than the left. The left wants to just take it all, and the right wants to take only half of it. So you have to f dig deeper and find out what is his objective to individualism, why life, he doesn't believe in a, why, and you have to explain to him why life requires property. He's probably a determinist. You didn't build that. It's just your genes or your environment or your privilege. So, but some people, again, are not worth debating because it's a waste of time. What is the proper moral response to musical artists 
who make asinine political evil statements. For example, Dua Lipa and David Gilmour. Um, I don't listen to musicians' political statements. I just, I don't. Jeffrey is willing to hire Alejandrina. I mean, your problem is solved, Alejandrina. That is a great job. You'll be working in one of the best restaurants in New York City. You're all set now. Um, so I ignore them. I mean, Cat Stevens, I don't even know if you guys know who Cat Stevens is, who, who, who I loved his songs, I still like his songs, became Muslim. He converted to Islam and went to, you know, I think he even lived in the Middle East and came back to the United States. But a real Muslim committed. Did I stop listening to the Cat Stevens that I enjoyed when I was young? No, I, I didn't. I didn't. Am I going to stop listening to Pink Floyd because David Gilmour is, is, has horrible political views? No. Am I going to stop listening to Wagner because he was an anti-Semite? No. <laughs> um, I judge the art based on the art, not based on the artist's character. If the politics enter into the art, that would be a problem for me. So I, I don't consume propaganda. But uh, I don't stop listening to something I really love because the person who created that happens to be a bad person. Now, I try not to... The more evil they are, the more evil their ideas, the less I'd be inclined to support them. Like, I wouldn't go to a concert. I'd be less inclined to buy a CD. I don't want money going directly from me to them and in that sense supporting their life. But if I already own the CD, I'm not going to burn it. Right. Um, Booyah42, thanks for everything you do. Do you have any tips on breaking ties from family members that prefer to be altruistic or ignore morals? I would just say just break them. Just don't be wishy-washy about it. Family is not a primary in life. It can be important if it serves your life. But to the extent that it's damaging or harmful or to the extent that they are immoral, just cut it off. Just say, look, I just don't want to deal with you. I, I, I find what you're doing offensive. Um, and... Um, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And just, just cut it off. The more you drag it out, the more you try to work around it. I mean, if they're really that bad. I mean, some people, yeah, I don't like certain family members, but not so offensive that I can't have a dinner with them once a year, right, in a, in a group setting. But some people you just have to cut out of your life. And, and you really need to be selfish about it. What is truly, it goes back to my rules for living. What is truly in my self-interest? What truly does my life deserve? Do I deserve? What truly will make my life better? And once you come to a conclusion about what that is, let's say cutting them off, then just do it. Don't wait. Did I man exchange letters with Farrah Fawcett? I think so, but I don't know. I, I can't remember. Can't remember. All right, we're at... We're getting there, thanks to Buya 42 and some other questionnaires. Buya put in $50, so it got us there quickly. We're $43 away from Alejandrina's goal. Uh, we're $40, $40 away. We just got $3. Um, so if anybody wants to do $40, I'll answer that question next if you do the $40, and we'll be done with it. And then I've got a few more questions here that I'm going to go through. But anybody want to jump in? We can also do four questions for $10 or 
uh, that'll be fine too, although it is getting late. My, 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 my uh, non-tooth is, is starting to hurt. My, my, the gap is starting to hurt. How come when New Yorkers move to Florida, they make the state more red? I'm not sure that's true. But when Californians move to Texas, they make the state more blue. Do New Yorkers just have more common sense? I doubt that. I think what's happening in New York is that the Republicans are leaving, and therefore they stay Republicans. Um, I think what happens um, when Californians leave, they're not Republicans. They're Democrats leaving. And they, they don't change to Repub becoming Republicans because they leave California. As I told you, most people are not on the far left who are Democrats. And the people who are moderately left, the real Mr. Meatball, thank you. Hope your tooth feels better. Happy belated uh, birthday. Thank you. All right, so we're over 400 now. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Jeffrey Miller, do you eat deserted restaurants? I recall you saying you don't eat much sugar. I don't eat dessert. I often ask, like in prefix restaurants, I often ask if they would substitute a savory dish for dessert, maybe a sweet, leaning savory dish. I know a number of like savory dishes that are, act like dessert, like um, uh, there was a, one restaurant served a foie gras bro, uh, brulee. Not as a dessert, it's like an appetizer, and that's like, to me, that's an ideal dessert. A little bit of sugar, but all that foie gras, the richness of it. Um, anyway, I shouldn't say I never eat dessert. At very, very good restaurants, you know, I'll, I'll at least taste the dessert. It depends how much inconvenience I'm going to cause the chef. I'm uh, a little allergic to cheese. Not horribly, but a little allergic to cheese. Unfortunately, I love cheese. So I, 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 I don't usually do a whole plate of cheese because it, it's, it's easy. Yeah, yeah, substitute is great. That, that's terrific, Jeffrey. Thank you. All right, um, that was my answer about New Yorkers. Uh, Re-socialism, doesn't England do it correctly? The people have health care, Shakespeare plays, rock bands, sports, unions, etc. What am I missing? Uh, you're missing the NHS, so health care sucks. Um, don't get too sick. Yeah, if you got a flu, you're fine with the NHS. Don't get COVID. Certainly don't get cancer or heart disease. Um, lots of people die waiting waiting for an MRI, waiting to see the doctor, waiting in line for the clinic. Um, don't have to go see a dentist. I can see Shakespeare plays anywhere. Uh, yeah, England does a lot of things good, all the non-socialist things. But England is not uh, any kind of ideal society. It's a good society because it's relatively capital, it's relatively free. But the socialist elements within England are terrible. Right? And they're going to get worse because uh, you know, they're, they're moving away from freedom under conservative government. They're moving towards more government intervention, more government controls. What are your thoughts about people leaving to become expats in places like Mexico, Brazil, and other countries that flirt with communism? What would make you announce citizenship or seek a new country? I don't have anybody, anything against people who leave. I don't think those countries are flirting with uh, communism, and to the extent that they are, those people will have to leave those countries. Um, but you can have a nice life in Mexico and certain places in Brazil. You have to, my main concern in a place like that is crime. Um, but a lot of people who, who can't afford to retire in the United States can afford to retire at the beach in Belize and live a good life. And, uh, yeah, maybe they're not as politically free, but politics is secondary. What's primary is your ability to live your life. And you got to be afraid of, worried about crime and such. What would cause me to renounce citizenship? If the United States got a lot worse, it would have to get a lot worse for me to renounce my U.S. citizenship. So I, I, I'm still happily a U.S. citizen, but... You know, I, went, I, I, I gave up, I, I left Israel, I moved to the U.S. If the U.S. got bad enough and I thought there was a better place, I'd move there. I'd move to kind of a, um, 
neither here, kind of still America, but not quite, and that's Puerto Rico. And so I, I benefit from being a U.S. citizen without paying the full cost of being a, an American citizen. Passionate, principled stance practically works in business too, not just politics. I've been shocked how easy it is to sway pragmatist executives. Absolutely. The practical is the moral. The moral is the practical. If you stick to your morality, it works. And particularly in business, you can get executives to do the right thing. And particularly if you, if you speak up because you're supporting them. Yohan, why would you not debate Chomsky? It would be like slaying Goliath in a sense. Because Chomsky is, if it was a slaying competition, maybe I would do it. But by agreeing to a debate, I would agree that he was in some sense worthy of it. And he's so despicable. He's so beneath contempt that I wouldn't, I, I would never, you know, Grant of that. Now he's 90 years old. I, I, I wouldn't do it for other reasons too. And he wouldn't debate me. But there are, just, there are few people in the world out there that are just too beneath contempt to, to really get on a stage with. All right, guys. Cool. Thursday, it's, um, you know, we'll have a bunch of my $25 donors and up. And if you are $25 a month don't, uh, contributor and you haven't got the invitation, then send us an email to let us know that you haven't been invited, uh, but you'll be able to ask questions live. Super Chat will be live as well. Um, Sunday, the same thing with $100, and we'll probably do a show for Saturday, my first show from the new, still under construction, condominium. So we'll see how that all works out. It, it's going to be interesting. All right, everybody. Um, have a great rest of your week and I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you all of you who made uh, Alejandrina's evening by getting us to 400. Thank you Alejandrina for going after everybody and getting them motivated. Don't forget to like the show before you leave. Uh, give it a thumbs up if you liked it. Uh, it helps with the algorithms and of course don't forget you can become and should become a monthly supporter of the of, of your own book show on your own bookshow.com slash support on Patreon on Subscribestar and on locals, and I will see you all on Thursday.